There we go. Um, first of all, uh, Peter and the AGA, thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm Scott Ketover. As Peter said, I'm, I'm president of Minnesota Gastroenterology. That's a 70 uh, gastroenterologist physician practice in the Twin Cities. Uh, I also have the distinction of being the immediate uh, past president, as of two days ago, of the Digestive Health Physicians Association, which is 1,300 uh, independent gastroenterologists from around the country, and I'll talk a little bit about that during my talk. And I'm also a chairman of an ACO, of a private ACO in, in Minneapolis that is composed of 3,000 physicians, uh, 1,200 employed and 1,800 independent. Um, I've been doing that for five years, and while it's been interesting and a lot of learning, I can tell you we haven't achieved much. Um, change is, uh, in some ways, is slower than we think it is. Uh, I'm, uh, some of my talk is, is redundant for things we've already done today, so I'll speed through that stuff and just try to highlight the things that we haven't uh, talked about yet or, or additional points. So we're all aware that change is coming. I don't have to belabor that point, that macro's here and it's going to be with us for a long time. Um, put my glasses on so I can read my slides. So is there an opportunity for, for specialists, particularly independent specialists that are not part of bigger uh, systems, to participate in the uh, alternative payment models? And, and so far, we don't know. We're hoping so, but we're not sure. Because if you're an independent specialist and you're not in an ACO, right now you don't have a direct pathway in the APM arm. Um, and hopefully as these rules are rolled out and the products are developed, we'll have the opportunity to participate in both the upside and downside risk uh, and help reshape uh, healthcare transformation. Um, with respect to quality measures, we've talked a little bit about this today. Uh, and we know that we've got quality measures that have been out there for a few years. Many groups are already following these things like ADRs and uh, interval to appropriate next colonoscopy and photo documentation of the cecum. There's some IBD measures that are out there as well. The consensus um, stuff is here as well. We, we talked about this earlier, so I won't belabor the point. But I think the, the aspect of these measures is that while most of them are surrogates for quality, in GI we don't really have much else right now. For a while, people have talked about, can we have a GERD measure? Can we have uh, better measures in cirrhosis? Um, but where's the big impact going to be in, in healthcare reform? Can we have an IBS measure, functional disease measure? I mean, chronic nausea. Those are the things that we see most of in our practice. We do see a lot of Barrett's, but we see way more chronic nausea and diarrhea that walks through the door than we do Barrett's patients. And so I'm not sure yet what are the other opportunities in GI, but we need to start thinking beyond the measures we already have, um, as particularly the ADR and the colonoscopy procedural measures. So what existing models do we potentially have for independent specialists at this point to get into the APM world? Um, one is proposed bundled payments and, and, and doing that possibly through the ACO route. Um, the other is technology-driven, and, and we've all heard Larry speak today about Project Sonar and, uh, and the integrated medical home, and I'll give a little bit more information about that as well. The challenge in the bundle, and particularly the colonoscopy bundle that we talked about this morning, is that the definitions really matter. So what do I mean by that? In, in 2011, my practice put together what we called pay one price colonoscopy. We spent a lot of time thinking about this after we were approached. It wasn't our initial idea. We were approached by uh, an insurance broker who came to us and said, hey, I've got all these self-funded employers out there um, who I think you guys could save a lot of money for. So we scratched our heads for a while and thought about it, and we said, what can we put together for them? And so here was our plan, pay one price colonoscopy. Basically, uh, the one fee, no a la carte charges. It's the professional fee for the physician doing the colonoscopy. It's the facility fee, including whatever sedation or anesthesia is used. It's pathology, both technical and professional components of pathology. It includes a pre-procedure assessment to make sure that the patient is appropriate not only to have a colonoscopy, but are they appropriate for the ambulatory outpatient setting. Um, it includes the PrEP. So we rolled the PrEP right into this. Um, we use the over-the-counter Miralax Gatorade PrEP for over 90% of our patients. We actually could buy those components all powdered for about nine bucks. So we give it away. We rolled it into this. Um, we have 24-hour nurse line support, and we did include a warranty. 
Now, our warranty wasn't as extensive as what you heard this morning. We include a 14-day warranty such that there's any complications from the procedure. We will not charge any professional fees to deal with those complications. So if I have a post-polypectomy patient who winds up in the hospital with a post-polypectomy bleed, I'm not going to eat their hospital cost, but I go to the hospital and do the colonoscopy for their bleed, or I round on them in the hospital. We won't submit any charges for my professional care of that patient. Uh, and we've been fairly successful with this bundle. With, uh, we've got six contracts now with uh, self-funded employers in, in the Twin Cities market, the largest of which we signed last year is a large union with 75,000 covered lives. Um, and the real benefit to this was the insurance broker who brought this to our attention. The way he marketed this to the employers is he sat down with the employer and he said, okay, last year you, you paid for 30 colonoscopies your average cost for those was $3,400. I'm making up the numbers as we go. It's $3,400. So we can figure out what you spent on colonoscopy last year. What if I can bring you a high quality group who could do all of those colonoscopies at $1,900 a piece? The employer very quickly understands that that difference, that delta stays in their checkbook. It's their cash flow. And so that's where we've gained traction. Where we haven't gained traction with this program is with third party payers. And the third-party payers initially told us, too complicated. You got too many pieces. Then they challenged us on an ethical piece. We heard that, well, how can we trust you as Minnesota Gastroenterology that you're actually going to pay the pathologist and the anesthesiologist and that we're not going to get bills submitted separately from those professionals for their services? So my first thought was, this is really a crummy discussion about trust. Really, that's what this is about? And my second thing was, you mean your systems aren't sophisticated to know that if the same patient on the same date received two professional charges from an anesthesiologist for the same service? Wouldn't kick that out? Anyway, we haven't gained much traction with the third-party payers, although other people have. Um, in, in 2012 and 13, I was part of the AGA task force on creating the bundle. There's lots of people in the room who also worked on this task force. Uh, and this was used to, the task force was to put together a plan that could then be rolled out across the AGA and, and to the public for how could other people set up the bundle. And essentially, it included the same three phases, right? What came out of that task force was there's a pre-procedure period that includes certain things, making sure the patient's appropriate to have a colonoscopy, they're appropriately screened, you get them, they're prepped, they're well prepped when they come in, they have a driver, all of those pieces. There's the procedure period, which is actually the day of the procedure when they have their colonoscopy done. And then there's the post-procedure period, which would include potentially some type of warranty or follow-up as necessary, as well as ensuring that whatever the outcome is of that colonoscopy, that the patient gets an appropriate follow-up recommendation. 10 years, 5 years, 3 years, 1 year, 3 months, whatever it is, but it's done on evidence-based guidelines. Alternatively, we heard a little bit about this this morning, the group in New Jersey that works with Horizon uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, they have a shared savings model that's a retrospective model, and I won't profess to be an expert on their model, only to understand, again, what we heard this morning, that the payer is looking backwards on total cost of care for the delivery of colonoscopy and comparing the current cost of care to what they've paid historically. And if there's a, a delta in favor of current costs are lower, they'll split that delta with the practice. And then we talked about reference pricing. So the big models that are out there in, in the lay press, for years Safeway has had a, a program, uh, CalPERS, which is the uh, Union of Public, Employee, Public Retired Employees, uh, published in another paper earlier this year around reference pricing for colonoscopy. And what they found on the West Coast was there was a wide variation in cost of colonoscopy between about $700 and about $8,000. And Safeway and CalPERS were paying for these. And they got tired of it. And they said, how can we lower our costs for all of our beneficiaries? And they set a reference price, around $1,200. Now, the reference price is for the facility fee and the professional fee for the colonoscopist. They carved out of that reference pricing any of the pathology and any of the sedation or anesthesia that would be done separately. But this has a lot of traction in the press. In fact, two years ago, Consumer Reports looks around the country and says, well, how much should a colonoscopy cost? Roughly, we're at that $1,200 mark. But again, if you look at the slide, what they're measuring is facility fee plus professional fee to the colonoscopist. So my question is, we've spent an awful lot of time as a profession, as, as gastroenterologists, saying, what do we think should be in the bundle? 
what makes sense to us to have a total cost of care product, but the marketplace thinks differently. You could go online today and find there are numerous uh, websites, you know, colonoscopy compare. There was one that went and came and went, was 1-800-colonoscopy. There's one I just learned of two weeks ago watching the news called Save On, Save On Medical. It's actually a couple of guys in Chicago. And, and you, you can go on these sites and look up what a colonoscopy should cost in your marketplace. And the elements that they're putting into cost are facility fee and fee to the provider who's doing the procedure. No path, no anesthesia included. So my question for the bundle, right, is that what should we do? If most of our commercial payers are reluctant, do we still have an opportunity with self-funded employers? And have we made this too complicated? Are all those pieces that I listed in the bundle that we have, is that just too much for the world to swallow and, and, and understand? Is it just simpler for us to ad abandon this academic model and go out there and just say, hey, $1,200, we'll, we'll meet the published reference price. In fact, through any, any organization, through the AGA, through DHPA, through any group of, of, of gastroenterologists, could we figure out some way to have a national bundle? We'll say, well, everybody who signs on, every group that signs on says, we'll take $1,200 for a combination of the facility plus the pro fee for uh, you know, screening and, and diagnostic colonoscopy, and recognizing that there are going to be a la carte add-on charges as they occur. But is this better for the marketplace? I'll pivot a little bit and talk about uh, Project Sonar, and Larry was, uh, this is Larry's pet project, which he spent uh, numerous years and, and much uh, uh, of his career on. Um, I will say that uh, when I first heard about Sonar and Larry presented it to me, I, I thought he had really rang the bell with this. Um, it's an, an inflammatory bowel disease patient engagement uh, CDS tool, clinical decision support tool. Um, it has been proven to, sh to improve IBD care and lower cost. There's no question about it that this tool works. The patients are engaged, the providers are engaged, and patients are getting better, better care at lower cost. Larry was smart enough to do this and make it EHR agnostic, so the, pro the product itself doesn't reside in your ENR or is not specific to an ENR EHR architecture, which is great, which means it's available to everybody. And basically, the provider receives a per member per month payment from the third-party payer in addition to the regular E&M contracting for delivery of care. Um, this is care management. But it's not care management done by a nurse call center by a third-party payer off-site hundreds of miles from where the patient is. This is care management done by the practice on the front lines with patients that they know and they have relationships with. And the outcomes are fantastic. And as of earlier this month, Larry has uh, attracted 14 GI practices that have either implemented sonar or have had discussions with Larry or are in phases of implementing sonar um, across seven states so far. Uh, and, and I wish him well and hope that it continues to to skyrocket. I will mention that of the 14 practices that have shown interest, 13 of them are, are in the Digestive Health Physicians Association. So with that, what exactly is DHPA? Uh, DHPA was created uh, two years ago um, by a group of us in private practice who recognize that our formal societies have relatively wide constituencies and that we felt that at times issues that were specific to independent private practice were underrepresented by our formal societies. So we decided to create an advocacy uh, trade association specifically for integrated independent private GI practice. Um, this was not to compete with the societies but to be additive to the to good work that they do. When we started off we had 11 groups and about 400 gastroenterologists and in two years we've now grown to 60 practices across 30 states and over 1,300 gastroenterologists. Um, and in 2015, we had over 4 million uh, distinct patient encounters. This is just a listing of the groups. I don't expect you to be able to read the slide, but we have fairly wide geographic distribution um, on both coasts and north and south uh, and trying all, all the time to fill in the gaps uh, with the number of practices. So we did a member survey uh, toward the end of last year of the practices to say, well, where are you on this idea about alternative payment models? You know, what's your thinking? And 54 of the groups responded with data. Um, some of these are fairly large groups, like my own, of uh, you know, 50, 60, 70. Some are as small as, as eight physicians. Uh, and everybody 
who responded said, yeah, we're interested, but we don't really know the rules. We don't really know what it means. But we're all forward enough thinking that we want to try to understand the rules as soon as we can and find out how this can benefit our practice and our care delivery model to our patients. So currently, of that group of 54 practices, about 40% responded that they're already in an ACO of some kind. However, the over major overwhelming majority of those ACOs are track ones, which means that they're not involved in downside risk in that ACO, which at this point means they wouldn't qualify for the APM. Um, so the groups are interested in saying, we'll take, we're willing to talk about taking risk, but we really need to better understand the rules. We need to understand the upside, the downside, and then the mechanics of how we get there. So some of the barriers to independent practice participating in alternative payment models. Again, quality measures. Can we measure the ones we already have in the consensus set? And are there other ones that are really of high value to improving population health? So far, there's been a limited ability for our groups to actually demonstrate that we can save money. You know, we know we can talk about we could save money by doing more colonoscopies in the ASC as opposed to the hospital setting. But other than that, where are the opportunities where we can save money? And again, that's where I talk about Larry's project with Project Sonar, uh, a demonstrated way to help get us to an intensive medical home. There are regulatory burdens for independent uh, practice, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, and this, as I mentioned this morning, there's cost of infrastructure. You know, when I think about in my practice, about th we're at about 38% government pay in our practice um, in terms of volume. That only represents 21% of our revenue. So now I'm looking at that 21% of revenue, upside 5%, downside 5% on that 21%. That's about a percent to me. How hard should I work to care? Right? Even if the upside is 20% on, on 20%, I'm looking at a 4% upside. So I really have to look at how many people am I going to have to hire, how many electronic systems do I have to put in place, how much maintenance do I have to do to appropriately get the data, report the data, and then deal with the, uh, the inevitable audits that occur, like we had in Meaningful Use 2. We had a whole bunch of audits. We passed them all, but again, rework of the system to get that money. Is it really going to be worth it to me, or do I just decide, you know what, I'll, look, I'll be in MIPS, and I'll look to be right on that zero line in MIPS, and I'll do that as easily as I can. And if, and if it still costs too much to do that, I could say, well, if it costs me 1% on the downside of my total revenue stream to not participate, you know, I can find some other way to make that up in my practice. Avenues for future participation. Um, as I said, there's significant interest in ACOs among the DHPA practices. 80% uh, said they're at least willing to explore these type of relationships. 75% um, of those respondents were interested in a CMMI initiative. Again, but we need to know the detail. As we say, the devil's in the details. We need to understand that. The other thing that DHPA really focuses on, as I mentioned earlier, is advocacy for the independent integrated model. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time in the last few years with, lo with our lobbyists and up on Capitol Hill and talking to uh, congressional leadership. Uh, we've been involved in the feedback for MACRA. In fact, last fall, DHPA submitted a rather lengthy brief to CMS when they were asking for feedback on the development of MACRA rules. Uh, we also responded when uh, both the Senate and the House put out a request around potential Stark Law reform and submitted a, a brief in that regard. And the last two days, we had 45 of the 60 DHPA practices were here in D.C., represented by a physician. We spent the two days on Capitol Hill, and we had 106 Hill meetings in those two days. Um, with a lot of stuff going on, but again, to talk about the issues of, and promote independent practice and also promote things like the remove the uh, barrier to colorectal screening act so that patients don't have to pay for the, or have the co-insurance when we find a polyp that was otherwise on a screening exam and talk about Stark Law Reform. Um, again, uh, skip this, CMS was asking for our feedback as they were from lots of groups. So what did D DHPA specifically say to CMS? What would be helpful? Well, one thing we asked for was that CMS really consider align reporting standards so that government and private registries could be the same, so we don't have to have one set in one direction and another set in another direction. Allow groups to provide efficient resource use to help manage downstream cost. Uh, and also, again, help 
groups find, if the groups go out of their way to find ways to save money and improve quality, make sure that this system enhances that rather than detracts from it. With respect to the Stark Law, I think all of us are familiar with Stark. It goes back over 25 years. Put in place with a great intention. Prevent independent private practitioners from having a self-referral motivation that would line their pockets. Subsequently, they have some in-office Stark Law exceptions for things like path labs, radiation therapy, physical therapy, um, and those exceptions have been in place for a while. But interestingly, there are some problems with Stark and MACRA, and they should have fixed Stark as part of MACRA, but they just, it wasn't on the table at the time, and now it's circling back. In fact, uh, Andy Slavitt from CMS uh, asked Congress to please fix Stark before they try to push out the macro regs so that they don't have to redo them down the road. In January, uh, the Senate Finance and House Ways and Means Committee started to solicit comments from the public on how to best modernize the Stark law and the openness dialogue. In fact, the Senate Finance uh, Committee has already scheduled upcoming hearings on Stark law reform. So what are the issues that we're really looking at for Stark law reform? One is um, we're really looking for a level playing field so that whether you're a physician in a large vertically integrated system, an employed system, in a multi-specialty group, or you're an independent physician in a group or working by yourself, we all have equal opportunity under Stark to perform in the macro environment. In the Stark, current Stark law, there's, re there's regulations that specifically say independent physicians cannot be paid based on volume or value. Now, back 25 years ago, they were referring to value as I shouldn't, as an independent practitioner, create value for myself. That's how they were using the word value. But because the language is in there, it would prevent me as an independent practitioner from participating in an APM that creates value for the healthcare system. I'd be in direct violation of Stark. So this is a problem that needs to be fixed. So we're essentially asking Congress, and Congress says, um, looks at this as a potential bipartisan effort. We'll see what happens. Hopefully, they'll move on it, but as we know in Washington, things move backwards before they move forwards. DHPA upcoming goals, we're working hard to educate our membership on MACRA, as we've seen a lot of the slides earlier today. Most gastroenterologists who are in practice day in and day out, they've heard of MACRA. They may have heard of MIPS and APMs. They have very little understanding of what the implication is. There is this kind of ethereal feeling that the work I do in 2017 is going to affect how I get paid in 2019, but it's March of 2016. And to be honest, most practicing gastroenterologists are worried about today, tomorrow, and next week, and they're not thinking that far ahead. Uh, we're trying to engage GI practices uh, to help shape policy. And in fact, uh, we're looking for uh, and developing between DHPA and the AGA, a better relationship that's mutually beneficial to promote these ideas. As I mentioned, we're looking at bundles and other ways to have national bundles or bundles that have real market attractiveness to those who are going to pay for them. Uh, and we're working hard to prepare the independent gastroenterologists to participate and succeed in the new world. But really, this is the key, my key take home point, is that gastroenterologists need to engage. And when we look around the room today, we say, there's not many of us here. It's, it's a problem. I'm not sure when we go to DDW in two months and we see thousands of gastroenterologists, how many of them will be focused on engagement around health care reform. And so I'm coming to the quick mindset that actually this engagement is going to happen amongst a handful of gastroenterologists, you know, those involved in the professional societies, some of those in DHPA, some in other groups. You know, maybe we're talking about 100 gastroenterologists around the country who are really going to help formulate how GI fits in the post-macro world. And the rest of our colleagues are either going to get it or they won't. But if we wait to try to get consensus around thousands of gastroenterologists, it'll be too late. So that's my message. Thank you for your attention.